I'd like to tell you a story. It's going to sound familiar to many of you, because almost all of us in this room, at one time or another, have been in a similar situation. Sometimes we played the hero, sometimes the villain, but more often than not, we played the shocked, silent bystander. This is a whistleblower story. Now, before I continue, I'd like to ask, what did you feel, what did you think when I said whistleblower? Did anyone hear, as I heard, as I often hear, two completely different voices? One that says, whistleblower, person of conscience, truth teller, hero. And the other, whispering in the background, says, whistleblower, tattletale, snitch, rat, traitor. So which voice is right? That's what I hope this story will help you decide. Imagine, if you will, you're a software engineer at Boeing in Seattle. You're working on the flight control system of the 737 MAX a multi-billion dollar project. You and your team are working at full speed because you need to beat Airbus, which is coming out with a competing project, to the market. Late in the game, as the delivery date approaches, you begin to have a terrible feeling. You sense that there is something broken in this software and that the FAA regulators, who are supposed to be riding herd on the project, are properly trained and they're too cozy with Boeing. Well, you take your concerns to your boss, but he doesn't seem to be bothered by it. So you take a chance and go up the chain of command to your boss's boss. She's not too troubled either. No one is doing anything. This broken, potentially deadly flight control system is about to go live on thousands of aircraft around the world. You've reached a crossroads, a whistleblower moment. You can either speak the truth loudly and clearly, or you can remain silent and become complicit in what follows. What do you do? Well, in the summer of 2018, 12 Boeing employees were in precisely this position. They chose to call the FAA Anonymous Whistleblower Hotline, where they describe their concerns about the software and about the regulators. You will note that by going through channels as they did, they were bringing the problem to the very people who were part of that problem. I think we all know what happened next. A few months later, two 737 Maxes crashed. The planes hit the ground at 600 miles per hour, all 346 people on those planes died. The black boxes tell a tragic tale of the pilots fighting their own flight control systems, which sinisterly headed off their every attempt to save their planes. This broken software, it appears, literally flew those planes into the ground. Now, the voices of these 12 Boeing employees were not heard in time to save 346 lives. Why not? Because they went through channels and only through channels. They did not take the dramatic step that true whistleblowing sometimes requires when the channels silence your urgent message to go outside your organization and blow your whistle loud and clear until someone pays attention. They did not, so far as we know, go to the board of Boeing. They didn't call flight safety activists. They didn't call the New York Times. And they didn't call the FBI. If they had done so, most of us in this room today would have applauded them. We would have thanked them for saving 346 lives and making our aircraft safer. We might have called them heroes. But the fact is that at Boeing and in the aircraft industry, 
Anyone who spoke out publicly, no matter how many lives they saved, would have been a snitch, a rat, a traitor. Their careers in the aircraft industry would have been over. Still, it seems strange to me that not one of these Boeing employees did actually blow the whistle publicly, because we are in a golden age of whistleblowing. In the last decade alone, insiders with a conscience have revealed to us an incredible range of wrongdoing, which threatens our economic well-being, our health, our lives, and our democracy. Whistleblowers have revealed the lead-laced water in Flint, Michigan, and the toxic mortgages, which brought down our economy in 2008. They've told us about the dangerous chemicals being pushed by Big Pharma and the lethal injection switches and airbags on our cars. Whistleblowers have explained to us how Cambridge Analytica and Facebook helped to corrupt our elections in 2016, and how kleptocrats and criminals are able to amass vast stores of wealth in offshore tax havens. The list of wrongdoing is literally endless that we would know nothing about if not for principled insiders who spoke out. As the walls of secrecy and self-interest rise around our organizations, the public is becoming more and more aware of how critical whistleblowers are to our well-being, to our public good. Dozens of new laws have been passed in the last few years alone to protect and aid whistleblowing. In fact, it's one of the very few things that our divided Congress can agree on. Elizabeth Warren and Chuck Grassley, as different as they are in every other category, both strongly support good whistleblower legislation. Scores of new films with blockbuster stars as heroic whistleblowers have strengthened our public awareness of whistleblowers as heroic figures, as pro-social. Yet this revolution in whistleblowing has a gap. There is a disconnect between our public celebration of whistleblowers and their acts and what actually happens to them in private, in their real lives. So let's imagine that one or two Boeing employees had actually stepped forward and become public whistleblowers. What would have happened to them? Well, to answer that question, I'd like to tell another whistleblower story, which had very, very different outcomes, both for society and for the whistleblowers themselves. I'd like you to meet Donna Bushy and Walt Tamasitis. These are two highly skilled, highly trained nuclear engineers who work or worked down at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in the Tri-Cities. Donna and Walt blew the whistle on a badly defective plant to process the most deadly nuclear waste in the Western Hemisphere. If that plant had gone online as it was designed, it might have caused a nuclear catastrophe that would have rendered large chunks of the Pacific Northwest uninhabitable. This theater, the street outside, the downtown area, all of Spokane, might be a wasteland right now. Empty. Dead. Well, it's not, thanks to Donna and Walt. At first, like almost all other whistleblowers that I have interviewed, they took their concerns through channels. They went to their bosses. They went to their bosses' bosses. When they got no joy there, they went further. They went to the regulators, to the Department of Energy, who in theory were regulating this plant. But when this failed, they did take that dramatic step to become a public whistleblower. They did call nuclear safety activists. They did call the press. They did hire lawyers, and they did, in the end, speak with the Department of Justice. They blew their whistle loud and clear until someone did hear. Well, thanks to Walt and Donna, a cataclysm was averted in the Pacific Northwest. And while they were at it, they revealed a multi-billion dollar fraud, our tax money being stolen. 
So for this invaluable public service, how were they treated? Well, at their workplaces, they were savagely retaliated against, they were publicly humiliated, they were demoted, and then they were fired. In their communities, in the Tri-Cities, they were treated not as heroes who saved the community, but as enemies of the people. This put an intolerable strain on their personal lives and on their health. These whistleblowers, ultimately, were blackballed by their industries. For me, this is the most serious indictment of our society. Their industries blackballed these whistleblowers permanently. These highly skilled, highly trained nuclear engineers will never work in their chosen fields again. This is the disconnect, the discordant message I was mentioning earlier, these two very different voices in our heads. We celebrate whistleblowers as heroes, and yet we allow them to be treated in real life as traitors. How can we be so two-faced? Well, I think the answer may be something like this. While in our heart of hearts and in the founding documents of our nation, we hold truth and justice to be our highest ideals, in the real world, in our workplaces, in our day-to-day -day lives, we often care more about loyalty and obedience than truth and justice. Now, loyalty and obedience are extremely important human emotions, deep-seated, critical for the proper functioning of our societies, our organizations, our families. In fact, I would argue that loyalty and obedience are about the only thing that make big family dinners at Thanksgiving tolerable. <laughs> but blind loyalty to toxic teams and to criminal leaders can cause catastrophes. It's this kind of thinking that flies airplanes into the ground at 600 miles an hour, that causes nuclear waste plants to explode, that brings down Enron and crashes our economy in 2008. We need a radically different kind of thinking. We need fewer team players, go-along-to-get-along personalities, and good soldiers. We need more people with the backbone to challenge their toxic teams, to disobey illegal orders. People who can hear the voice of their conscience, even in a noisy crowd. But I wonder, how revolutionary, really, is this kind of thinking in America? What Americans do we know who risked their freedom, their honor, and their lives to speak truth to a corrupt power? Well, here are a few Americans who valued this kind of thinking. We don't usually think of them as particularly radical. And they valued people who blew the whistle. Abraham Lincoln, in 1863, at the height of the Civil War, when he discovered that military contractors were robbing the Union Army blind, he passed a whistleblower law, the False Claims Act, which enables every citizen of America to become a private attorney general and prosecute fraudsters, and if they win, to pocket a bounty in the deal. This law, the False Claims Act, also known as the Lincoln Law, is still, to this day, the most powerful tool against fraud that we have in America. A hundred years earlier, when George Washington and his troops were fighting for survival against the British in New Jersey, the Continental Congress received a petition from 10 servicemen, 10 US Marines and Navy men, who accused their supreme commander, the Commodore of the Navy, of war crimes and dereliction of duty. Did the Continental Congress call them snitches, spies, traitors? Did they throw them in jail or drive them into exile? No, they did not. Quite the reverse, they too passed a whistleblower law, which proclaimed it the right and the duty of all citizens of this country to call out wrongdoing by public officials wherever they find it, including among the leaders of the land. In fact, the founders wove the basic concepts of whistleblowing, the right and the duty to warn, freedom of speech, the sovereign importance of the individual conscience, into the fabric of the nation 
For them, whistleblowers were good citizens, and whistleblowing was a critical act of a healthy democracy. In fact, I go one step further. I would argue that the founders themselves were in some very real sense whistleblowers. They challenged the authority of their divine monarch to follow a higher authority to the principles of truth and justice. They broke loyalty with Mother Britain to follow higher loyalties to this new nation they were building and to humankind. So this revolution this radical new way of thinking about whistleblowers that I'm calling for is really not all that revolutionary react reactivity. This revolution, this radical new way of thinking about whistleblowers is really not all that revolutionary at all. It's a return to America's basic principles. When we hear Thomas Jefferson proclaim that huge banks and a standing army are deadly to our democracy, when we hear Benjamin Franklin announce that death to tyrants is obedience to God, we don't think snitch, rat, traitor. And by the same token, when a whistleblower today calls out an inconvenient or a shocking truth, we need to think patriot. Thank you very much.